Welcome to Welcome to Parrot Literary Corner. I am Dustin Pickering, your anchor and host. Today's guest is Sean Arthur Joyce, whose poems and essays on poetics have appeared in Canadian, American, and British literary journals. Most recently, his poems have been anthologized in the limited edition series, Nature and Myth, an anthology of Nanaimo Poetry, Public Library, Canada, Fire and Sky, uh, and Awake in the World too. Uh, Joyce has also produced poetry videos, starting with The Muse Chameleon Fire in 2001, funded by Bravo TV. In 2016, Joyce produced his second poetry video, Dead Crow Prologue, with music composed by Noel Fudge and video production by Eye Candy Films. In 2020, Joyce produced Dead Crow and the Spirit Engine with his limited editions imprint, Chameleon Fire. This collection is a revival of the narrative long poem form that explores the intersection of the mythic archetype and poetry, as well as the Jungian concept of the shadow that lives within us all, a potential source of both mayhem and transformation. Joyce has published three books of Western Canadian history, and his first novel, Mountain Blues, was published in May 2018 by New West Press. Thanks for joining us today, uh, Sean. How are you today? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, quite welcome. Um, so my first question is, um, in, the, in your bio, you mentioned archetypes and, and young. When did that first come to you and when did you start incorporating that into your into your uh, poetic work? Well, I've been a lifelong student of mythology, uh, certainly at least for the last 20 to 25 years. And um, I'm a big fan of uh, the work of Joseph Campbell um, mm -hmm. is into using mythic archetypes, probably, you know, early in this century. Um, some of the first crow poems I had probably dated from about 20 years ago. And gradually that process over time accrued into an entire collection and a, and a vision for kind of a, a total project that included video and performance and costume and, you know, so on, even touring. Interesting. Uh, and so in, in, in your book, um, The um, Dead Crow, um, I was watching a video interview um, on that, and and you talk about using an antihero. Um, so I wondered, this is kind of a strange question, but how did writing an antihero teach you about empathy for life's sort of degenerates? And uh, did you ever relate writing in, in the poems? Did you ever relate to Dead Crow? Yes, I did. I mean, um, the interesting thing about that is when you start exploring these mythic archetypes, Dustin, uh, they start to take on a power of their own. Um, it, it becomes a voice that starts to speak through you. And certainly, I think, um, as a young kid growing up in a Western Canadian mill town, where there was an awful lot of um, redneck kind of mentality, uh, anybody that was different, uh, maybe a little smaller or wore glasses like I did as a child, uh, was immediately a target. So I could sort of identify with this character that gets pushed to the margins of his society. Mm -hmm. And in, in the case of Dead Crow, he's actually expelled from society completely because of mm -hmm. a, a sin that he commits, right? And so I really had a lot of uh, touchstones for that in my childhood, I think, as I'm sure many people today also do as well. Um, and as I said, it kind of took on a life of its own as the voice developed, as with any good character in literature, if it's a strong sort of independent voice, um, it has elements of you and also elements of not you as well. Right. And so, um, so it's sort of like a part, you, you know, it's not really autobiographical, obviously, but it, there's definitely elements like of your emotional life and, uh, and your yeah. personal life is put into the, the characteristics of this uh, character. Um, yeah. So another thing I had about that particular collection 
was um, used the phrase quintessence of loneliness. And in the discussion I watched, which is available on your website, um, you talk about how that using that, you know, using loneliness introduces metaphysics into the book. And I wondered how, how did that work? How did you um, bring metaphysics through that, that particular um, phrase or that using loneliness rather than using something more concrete? Well, I think um, because, you know, Dead Crow uh, is somebody who's seen an awful lot in the universe, you know, that it, there's a bit of a sci-fi premise to it, which is that he comes from another galaxy, another world, another set of conditions. And so then he is relegated or actually exiled to planet Earth and then has to start all over. So in many ways, he doesn't have common frames of reference. You know, he, he has some common frames, but uh, in many ways, he is really rewriting his own book. And so I, I felt like that allowed a lot of scope for exploring, you know, sort of philosophy and ethics and history, you know, really the whole spectrum of uh, things that really are about us as humans. But when you use this sort of device, you know, a literary device of, of an alien kind of character, uh, it helps to also actually focus human issues as well. So that was kind of where that came from. Hmm. That's interesting. I think, uh, you know, bringing in um, emotional, more of an emotional thing kind of gives an existential feel to it. Yes. Um, and so you, you know, you uh, doing this, you bring out uh, a humanness of the character. Yeah. Um, and, and I think people can relate more to, uh, to that and more to an abstract story. I mean, you're using archetypes, which contain emotional content, obviously. Yes. And, uh, yes. and so, um, you know, bringing in, uh, you can bring in history and you can bring in, as you said, ethics and all sorts of subjects into the, into the field. And, uh, of course, in speaking of history, you've also written some history books. Um, so yes. I wondered, um, one of them is laying the children's ghosts to rest. I'm curious, where did you first hear of this story of the that you based the uh, the um, writing on, and what was the process of researching and writing like? Uh, that actually was something I stumbled over in the process of doing uh, family genealogical research. Um, mm -hmm. You know, on my uh, mother's side, who were actually American, uh, based out of Los Angeles. Um, we had a complete workup of our entire background, our family history. But on my father's side, which was the Canadian side, we really had nothing at all. And I thought that was strange. You know, it just seemed odd that there was this giant blank there. So I started doing research. I'm trained as a journalist. So of course I know how to do research. And um, very quickly I discovered in getting my documents from the National Library in Ottawa that my grandfather had arrived in this country as a child immigrant aged only 15 and without any parents. And again, I had to wonder why that would happen, you know, that a, a kid that age would arrive in Canada basically on his own. I think he, there was two other boys younger than him with him and a chaperone at the time, this would be 1926. Mm -hmm. And uh, then someone said to me, oh, he was probably one of these British home children. And I said, what's that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, who knew, right? Right. And, um, yeah. you know, and it turned out that there were 100,000 plus boys and girls that were shipped from Britain to Canada alone. That's not including the other colonies that that these kids were shipped to, uh, to work as indentured laborers on farms. And wow. many of them, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, this is where I often say that um, slavery is no respecter of race, right? I mean, slavery has happened to white people, it's happened to native people, it's happened to black people. Um, mm -hmm. It really is about power, it's about imperial power and colonial power and so if you happen to fall into a category uh, of extreme poverty as my ancestors some of them did 
and many of these other home children did, uh, under that particular system, you ha had no rights. You could be sort of plucked out of your neighborhood or out of your family and, and be told by the government, well, your family can't care for you, can't properly feed you, house you, whatever. So we're going to do that. But in exchange, we're going to send you to another country. And when you're there, you are going to work, right? Mm -hmm. And essentially have no freedom until you are legal age. And so that's what they did to these kids. Uh, many of them were supposed to be paid for their labor and never were. Uh, they had to live in uh, barns and, and you know, outhouses and you know, freezing cold attics and so on. So um, this was a whole new world to me that I hadn't known about in my own family history. You know, it was like this giant mm -hmm. blank page just screaming to be written, you know, and, right. um, you know, so that's when I started doing more and more genealogical research. Uh, my wife and I traveled to seven different archives, including London, England, uh, Victoria, BC, Canada, Ottawa. Um, and it turns out there's a huge amount of archival material about this program and how the governments the churches, the social service organizations, all colluded together in this project of mm -hmm. taking poor white children, I guess today we might say poor white trash, and shipping them to the colonies to work as indentured laborers. Wow, that's, a, that's captivating. Um, so uh, you also do um, historical writing on West Kootenai. So is there any interesting stories that you've uncovered from your uh, research there? Um, well, this, this area was uh, very much a case of kind of the, the Western North American mindset. You know, it was considered a frontier area. Again, not respecting the fact that First Nations people had already been here for thousands of years. Um, but again, what this is what happened at the time was that you had the, this colonial influx of uh, Europeans coming in to exploit the mineral resources. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that even though we were, you know, in this very Western mindset that it was shared somewhat with Western America, um, we still had enough of a British mindset here that the rule of law and order at the time in the late 1800s was still very much respected and enforced. We had the classic story of the Northwest Mounted Police, the forerunner of the Canadian Mountie, who he, he might have had his carbine or his Winchester, but most of the time that stayed on his horse. And he used his capacity for dialogue to resolve situations as much mm -hmm. as possible. And of course, you also had um, a very strict rule on guns. Even then in the late 19th century in Canada, we really did not allow a wide proliferation of guns. So you have this story of um, a big tough American a miner prospector type coming into my little community here in New Denver 100 years ago. And he's got the bandoliers across his chest and he's got the Bowie knife and the Winchester and the Colt 45. And the local police constable says, well, you know, you're not going to need any of that stuff here. Hmm. So just leave it with us, you know, go off into the mountains and do your prospecting. And, you know, when you're done, come back and see us. I'll give you a receipt. You give us back the receipt and you'll get your guns back and you can go back home to the States. <laughs> hmm. That's fascinating. You know, yeah. So it was a very different mentality. It wasn't just the sort of, you know, Wild West kind of. Right. Mentality. Do you find in your research in history that um, the present is very much this, is similar to still it hasn't changed things haven't changed much in that regard like in general do you find that the roots are still there in the, of the of the uh, present the, when you look at the right now and then you look in the past is the same value system same kind of uh, approach to life is that something that you've recognized? Yeah, I mean I. I think it's important to note um, degrees of difference. I mean, obviously, we have a lot more 
equality enshrined in law now than we certainly did a hundred years ago. Um, that said, you know, if you look at the level of the power players, you know, the government, the corporations, uh, that level, uh, I don't really see much difference there. I think that they're operating on a lot of the same kinds of principles of, you know, mass exploitation and, uh, you know, coercion of government authorities to get their agendas carried out. Um, you know, using propaganda on the population to get them to subscribe to, for example, you know, the COVID thing. Um, so in many respects, you know, things haven't changed in other respects they have. And uh, so I think it's important to sort of qualify, you know, the difference of degrees. Interesting. Um, so uh, moving into the poetry again, uh, do you find that anything interesting about specific scene you, you know you're in? Do you go to the live events and read, or, or you know prior to COVID, of course, uh, or maybe even like you know, do you have plans for the future for promoting? Yes, I do. Um, I've been a longtime performer. I started performing back in the 1980s uh, when myself and three other poet friends we were still just in our 20s and we formed a, uh, a collective called Grassroots Oracles and we toured around and we performed. And so I never really lost that, you know, even before SLAM, um, I felt it was really important to have that ailment because I used to say, if you're only getting the poem on the page, you're only getting half the poem, right? Because right. when the poet actually reads and performs their own work, if you know if they know what they're doing, um, you're getting this whole other dimension of meaning, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and shades of meaning and so on. Um, so yeah, I've kept that up. Of course, you know, under COVID, that hasn't been possible. But um, my last performance of the Dead Crow uh, piece was in 2018, and that's recorded on my website. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have plans for a new poetry video that myself and my composer, Noah Fudge, are going to be working on. And it will premiere my next collection, which is called Diary of a Pandemic Year. And this is a, a series of poems, 26 poems that I wrote, uh, essentially almost like a diary, but kind of larger than a diary, not just my personal thoughts, but what was going on in the world at the time. And um, the poem is called The Day After COVID, the last one. And that's mm -hmm. the one that we're going to do. And we're going to do a, a big video workup for it. Interesting. Uh, so are you, do you, do you find music plays any, any factor into your work at all? Um, as far as like, do you listen to music while writing? Or do you, you know, do, do you have any specific favorites that kind of impact your writing? Excellent question, Dustin. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because uh, I've been a, a passionate music lover my whole life um, mm -hmm. from the time I was like 12 years old. And uh, I was lucky enough to be born in a generation when a lot of the what we today know was classic rock um, music was being minted. And uh, I was just a young teenager at the time. So I got to listen to all these amazing bands that have stayed with me my whole life. Um, including uh, the progressive rock scene, mm -hmm. uh, which you know started with the classics like Yes and Genesis and Gentle Giant and bands like that, and have carried on to today with bands like Transatlantic, The Flower Kings, Riverside, and so on. And so, um, and then another one that I really like is Tangerine Dream, which was the the pioneering German uh, group that started creating the sound with synthesizers in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And I just find that, you know, it, it, it just creates a kind of a, I don't know, a, a, it's not just a mood, but a kind of a, a feeling or whatever that uh, if I'm writing, it gives me extra sort of energy or something. You know, mm -hmm. there's just something that like, like a, a synthesis going on. You know, I've got the music going, I've, I'm in that headspace, I'm writing. Um, and sometimes I find um, I actually do better 
I write better if I'm listening to music than if I'm not. Disempowering. Like, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Would you maybe like to share a poem or two with us? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I will, let's see now, what have I got here? <laughs> got a couple of things, kind of put me on the spot there a little bit, but I'll read oh, a couple sorry about poems. That. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. That's what this is all about, right? Right. Um, so I'll read a, an excerpt from a piece that I call Summer of Fire. And this mm. is kind of an environmental piece. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, just to set it up a little bit, uh, three years ago in British Columbia, where I live, uh, we had absolutely major fire season and my parents were at risk of being evacuated uh, up in the central British Columbia, Chilcotin Plateau, uh, where the, the um, uh, traditional Chilcotin peoples live. And mm -hmm. um, it was just huge. They were, they were facing possibly tens of thousands of evacuations. In fact, the, the entire city of Williams Lake was evacuated. Uh, my parents refused to go. Um, they felt like they were safe and so they didn't. But it got me thinking about, you know, what's been happening with the environment, right? And our impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. and, you know, particularly this sort of whole corporate consumer lifestyle that we've been kind of brainwashed into during the last 50 years. So this is part three of Summer of Fire. You will come aching, stomach a gash in the body of hunger. You will come on all fours, paws carrying hidden reserves of power. You will stride continents with a mouth of fire and not care that we confess the sin of narcissism. It will be too late. Forests candling in the bone throat of summer, mountains shedding glaciers like perspiration. You will be hungry, thirsty for everything. Nothing will sate the collapsing spiral within. You will lick the spilled milk of nebulae, eat the blue fire of new pulsars, appease the hungry ghosts with yet more nothing. Never be granted an audience with the alpha and the and only dimly glimpse the omega. You will both eat and be eaten in a feast of sons. You will both mm. you will both eat and be eaten. Um, that can... line sounds uh, very um, metaphorical to me. Uh, what message are you trying to convey there? Well, it's really that um, you know we are paying the price for our own excesses, right? Uh, so we're both eating in the sense that we're consuming, whether it's food or consumer products. Mm -hmm. And we are being consumed, for example, during these terrible wildfires that break out because of global warming. It's sort of a reap what you sow kind of thing. Yeah. I notice a lot of um, images of hunger and, and um, food related, you know, so it's consumption on that on that scale as well and i think that, that that's a really interesting metaphor for um sort of you know insatiable consumption of that's involved in um contemporary life so where did you come to that metaphor or did that just happen naturally well i think uh it's hard to always know where this stuff comes from i mean uh, mm -hmm. Often I find with a poem, I might start with a certain intention, but where I end up is somewhere else. You know? Right. Um, it, I very much believe in the spirit of the muse. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that, that that's a real thing, whether you want to call it, you know, a psychological principle or something that exists as another element out there or whatever. Um, certainly poets down through the millennia have always felt that sense of a sort of a higher 
power or spirit or whatever that's coming through them right right so i like that uh i had a Saksika blackfoot counselor years ago tell me he talked about how uh, their view was that a person should be a hollow bone that the universe sings through hmm that's quite a uh, image yeah and what i took from that was that you know rather than sort of focusing on ourselves and our ego you know if we can make ourselves as clean and clear a conduit for the muse as possible then you know what we're getting indeed is coming from whatever that realm is whether it's our collective unconscious or something out there you know by kind of getting ourselves and our egos out of the way we allow ourselves to be a clear channel for that to come through right and there's so much inexplicable you know related to the artistic process i know psychologists neuroscientists and they're, they're baffled by the creative process it seems like everything i've read on the on the subject it's uh they're just very much you know they have a few descriptive words and that's all they can come up with and uh, even from us and our point of view we don't really have a clear answer as to what is behind our inspirations yeah so yeah. you also have written a novel and um that would be mountain blues i believe yes. um did you discover anything about human nature and 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 writing it and and what exactly is the book about uh, the book is about a very small mountain town um, in the southeastern British Columbia region where I happen to live. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. They say, write what you know. That's the common adage in, in, uh, in writing workshops is write what you know. Um, so being a first-time novelist, I took that to heart. And uh, I had been also working as a journalist in my community for nearly 20 years at the time. And I had this huge bank of stories, nonfiction stories that I had written for the newspaper. And I kept thinking, you know, one of these days, I'm going to have to mine that archive of my news stories for fiction stories. Mm -hmm. So the first, first thing that, that came out of that was this idea for a novel where, you know, I sort of combined a lot of elements from stories I had written about real life and also combine different characters that I actually knew in the community. And in a couple of cases, the characters were very perilously close to real life, um, but fortunately flattering. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, uh, I partly got the inspiration from the classic TV series, Northern Exposure. Mm -hmm. Remember that one? Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, you got the moose wandering through mm -hmm. the main street and you know mm -hmm. you've got the sort of cool funky guy that that's the dj with the radio station and you know the new york uh physician you know those kinds of character ideas <clears throat> that i wanted to explore myself in my novel excuse me and so um i created this story where you have a, a government coming into town government agency health agency and they've said you know what our analysts have decided based on your numbers you don't need a hospital here you can go somewhere else to get medical services which by the way happened here and we live in a semi-remote mountain community where the nearest full service hospital is 100 kilometers or 60 miles away hmm. so you know you can imagine if suddenly you you've half cut your your arm off and you've got to wrap that up and somehow wait and survive 60 miles till you get to the hospital right your chances mm -hmm. are not going to be good um so i really in a way was using the novel uh for activism in that sense you know to try mm -hmm. and talk back to the government and create the story and show them how ridiculous an idea it was that they could think that this semi-remote community could somehow do without a hospital. And so I had this story where everybody in this small little community in their own sort of crazy little ways comes together to save the hospital 
and thereby save their town. And that's basically what it's about. Interesting. Because you save the health uh, of your community, you save the life of the community. That's indeed a very unique way to hand the story. Um, uh, uh, do you by any chance have anything to do with uh, Aradne Sawyer, the founder of World Poetry Canada and International? Because you are based in British Columbia. Yes, yes, she's a friend of mine. Do you know her? Like yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I've worked with her for more than uh, a decade now. I received, um, there was a time I was part of the awardees. Uh, for World Poetry Cultural Ambassador Award. That was another time, like twice. And uh, even my book was published by the International, I mean, the, the World Poetry Canada and International. So tell us about your activities in the society there. How do people uh, see creative writers in British Columbia? Um, well, Unfortunately, there's a kind of a have and a have not mentality. Um, as you know, we see this reflected throughout society, don't we? Um, you know, you've got the West Coast writing community and the media, most of the media in our province is located there as well. Vancouver, of course, huge mm -hmm. city. Victoria, mm -hmm. another large, huge city. Um, and so all of the attention gets focused on the west coast riders so if you live you know 600 kilometers inland as i do right some 350 miles away from vancouver um you know you're kind of off the map almost which is why i'm so grateful to you guys for inviting me on the show because you know even with the internet i find it can be a real struggle to be heard you know from kind of way out there as it were you know, literally in the backwoods of British Columbia. Um, at the same time, we have a, a very strong, vibrant arts community here in this region that we call the Kootenays, which is named after the First Nations people. Um, we have professional opera singers. We have uh, people that write opera librettos and, and classical music and jazz and you know, blues, we have a blues society here. I'm a huge blues fan. Um, so it's odd because it's not like we don't have the quality. It's just that we're kind of off the map. So it's it's hard to be heard. And by the way, I'm grateful to Ariadne because several times she's invited me to Vancouver to be on her Vancouver Co-op radio show. So kudos to her and you guys. <laughs> yeah, she's it's, it's really trying. She, she's like a woman um, uh, representing a battalion. You know, she, she, yeah. she works tirelessly to promote the art and the artists, not only in Canada, but across the globe. So she's really, really commendable. You know, a lot of her work, you know, she, apart from being a port, she engages um, a lot of uh, creative minded people within the country and outside the country. Uh, kudos to her again, to uh, really appreciate her. And uh, so beyond being inviting you, have you ever done something, maybe creative work together with her? Maybe uh, a kind of publication? I haven't actually worked with her in that way, no. Uh, I've just been a guest on her show so far, but and mm -hmm. I kind of lost touch the last few years, so I'm not really uh, current on what she's doing now. Yeah, if you are active on Facebook, I've, I guess you would have had uh, enough, uh, I mean, opportunity of uh, meeting with her. We have a group on Facebook where all creative minds uh, meet, especially the World Poetry members. Anyway, I'm very glad that um, you you finally find right. time to join us on the show today. So what's your final message for our viewers at home? As we have uh, less than three minutes to round up. Um, well, I, I feel like uh, poetry is something that too often gets a bad rap. Um, a part of this, I believe, has to do with the fact that our public school curriculum over the last several decades has steadily downplayed poetry to the point where it's almost non-existent. And of course, you know, in a sense, you're also competing with all of this sophisticated media 
right? You know, these great CGI movies and, and, you know, CGI video games and all these things that can occupy people's mental space. But none of those things to me has the power that poetry possesses inherently. I find, especially during this past year when we've been under so much stress, um, for me, reading a poem is like making a prayer. Or another example would be like a Buddhist meditating. There's just something about uh, what that does to your, your whole frame, your consciousness that I at least find very, very grounding and, and, and very spiritual too. So that's what I would say, don't give up your poetry. Don't give up the poetry. Uh, that's that's a great message to impart to the uh, readers and the listeners and the viewers here um, at Parrot TV Literary Corner. We're doing the 1 million subscriber challenge and we would like people to subscribe to the YouTube. We're looking for creative minds to, uh, anybody who wants to subscribe of course can subscribe, but we're trying to show support for the creative community and show the world that we do indeed exist. And we would love anybody to subscribe that would uh, appreciate our content. We work with uh, poetry, we work with uh, artists and musicians and interviews in order to uh, come to some, some mutual understandings and develop a sort of an idea of what the world around us is like for artists. Uh, so we're looking for global, you know, we're not just looking for the United States. We have Sean here from Canada. We've had all kinds of great uh, people from all over the world, from India, from, uh, you know, Africa, in the, you know, anything. So if you would like to help us out, uh, please feel free to subscribe. And, and, and Sean, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a wonderful, it's been pleasurable to talk with you. You've had some interesting insights. And uh, thanks to our viewers as well. So subscribe to the channel. And this has been Parrot TV Literary Corner. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time with us. My name is Mutio Lawi. Thank you, Shane. I hope we meet next time. Thank you for watching.